Hello and welcome to Go Green. My name is Richard Mullen and I'm your host for the show today. And today we have a very, very special guest from, uh, from Nashville. Let's see, where are you from? Oh, Director of Energy and Environment Policy, Tim Rogan from National Grid. Tim, first I want to thank you for coming in because you came from Waltham, right? And yeah. it's a bit of a trip, so I, I thank you. But I think the information we're going to share today and with our audience I think is going to be really helpful. So I know as I meet people in different programs and going out to the communities, there's a lot of questions about National Grid, and I think Tim is the guy that's going to uh, clear them up. So let me ask you the first question and the simple one. What's the future of energy? Well, first, thanks for <laughs> inviting me today, Richard, uh, to, to the show, because I think it's very exciting. I mean, we've been uh, serving Haverhill for many, many years for the electric and now gas uh, 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 customers we have here in Haverhill. You know, the exciting part in today's world about energy is really the fact that, you know, the old world of centralized energy, um, big power plants around, is, is slowly migrating away. It's not going to be gone, you know, in the next five years or 10 years, but it's slowly going away to more of a distributed energy type of system, which we see with all the big uh, solar on folks' roofs. I mean, we built the 700 kilowatt solar project here in town, matter of fact, here in Haverhill about four or five years ago mm -hmm. um, as uh, I'm part of our, one of our old brownfield sites. So we managed to take a, a parcel of land that wasn't really doing much for the city or for us and made it into some tax producing properties uh, for the city. So it worked out. I so think both so that's us. your site that's up on, uh, up, up on the hill kind of. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. How many panels are there? That, I mean, that's, that's good a size, isn't 700, it? six or 700 kilowatt project, part of a larger five megawatt or 5,000 kilowatt project. Uh -huh. We built them in Haverhill. Um, uh, we built one in Dorchester. I'm uh, forgetting it goes back a ways, but it's a uh, part of our phase one solar program. Okay. Uh, you know, we've got a phase two now uh, where we're also building some solar that the company owns. But those are, uh, that's more for the research and development efforts okay. around the integration of solar with the electric distribution system. Right. And I mean, I guess the, to me, as I look around and I talk to a lot of people, National Grid is not something that's on its way out. I see National Grid actually becoming more of a distributor. Like I think you just about alluded to it is that you'll be taking green energy or whatever you can get so we can have electricity. And yeah, green energy will, will increase, I believe. Oh, and, and, it, and it already is, right? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, the, we already got greener energy with the retirement of lots of coal plants and all the introduction of a lot of new natural gas-fired plants that are you know, twice as efficient as the old plants we had in New England back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the Restructuring Act, folks forget, but you know, 17 years ago now, we, we um, the electric industry was changed in Massachusetts, where sure. you know we used to own the big power plants, like at Salem Harbor, and and all, and then delivered all the power to the end use customers. And post 2000 or so, you know those plants got sold off to private investors, and National Grid really just became the delivery agent of the power from those power plants and power plants all over New England, including wind farms in Maine and uh, landfill gas projects, and obviously lots of photovoltaic systems, solar projects around the around the state as well. So in your position, then you must get a kind of an insight into what's happening out there in the thing. Is, is there a lot of wind coming up? Or can we depend on a, uh, is, will wind get really big or slightly big in the next 10 years? I think what's, the, the challenge wind has, it's just big. It's just mm -hmm. really big. You see the turbines up in Gloucester, <laughs> you know, as you get into town. Um, they're big and ultimately it's got a more of a challenge, sighting challenge, and for what the neighbors will see, mm -hmm. the whole not in my backyard sy syndrome, the NIMBY. So the onshore wind is a lot, is pretty difficult to build in a very dense population area like the state of Massachusetts. That's why the wind farms we have, the one in, that's in service in Mass, for example, is out in the, in the Berkshires, right off the Mohawk Trail. You've got wind farms up in the Maine, uh, in the woods of Maine and Vermont and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but the real opportunity for wind for, the, for this area and part of the new legislation that just got signed is the offshore wind. That's um, the requirement to purchase six, up to 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind over the next 10 or so years. And uh, the beauty of this sort of thing, we've got 
you know, the continental shelf off the state is, you know, goes out really far. Yeah, we could go out pretty So good. you can put these wind farms 20, 30 miles offshore, mm -hmm. so no one will ever see them. But the water is still only 150 feet deep. So yeah. the technology is there to build wind farms like that offshore. And they've been doing that for 20 years in Europe and in, around the UK. So we're finally going to see more of that development, which is going to really? provide a real great uh, green mix back to in, in, into the system here for but, New England. Uh, I would say that from, from what I can learn, too, is that in the next 10 years, natural gas is still going to be around. Yeah, natural gas has to be around as a bridge because even the wind turbines offshore uh, won't produce electricity all the time mm -hmm. because the wind doesn't blow all the time. It blows a lot more out there than it does onshore, but it's still there's times where there's no wind, just like at night when there's no sun, um, or even in the winter months where the sun you get is very limited. Uh, so you do need something to provide power because we have to remember there's 8,760 hours in a year <laughs> and we need power for every hour, every minute, every second of that, right. you know, because we want to wake up in the morning and make sure our milk is still cold in the refrigerator and we didn't have to turn the power off overnight because we didn't have power. Right. So you just always need uh, a mix, a portfolio of systems that are out there and that's where natural gas is going to fill a need for, for quite a and quite a long time. We're, we're fortunate in one way that natural gas, as I understand it, uh, supports what about 50 60 percent of our uh, energy in currently Massachusetts? yeah and currently in the greater uh, New England footprint uh, in Massachusetts being part of that yeah easily 50 60 percent of the mix of energy now uh, for for various reasons one of the principal reasons are actually was the you know coming out of the Clean Air Act where mm -hmm. frankly you know 20 years ago 25 years ago you couldn't have permitted and built a coal plant in Massachusetts because you couldn't meet the air permitting requirements, right. although natural gas can. So, you know, folks are a little concerned, maybe we have too many of our eggs in the, in, in the natural gas basket on power, but you have to think about the actual permitting and regulatory regime and why they're built there. I mean, you, couldn't, you can't build a new nuclear power plant, so you can't talk about that one either. Coal's not out. So for massive bulk power generation, natural gas is, is today the most economic choice. Do you have any uh, kind of a to think about and plan for the problems with fracking, for example. I mean, in order to get natural gas, we have to frack now. Is that correct? I mean, all our gas is coming through a fracking process. Am I right or am I? Uh, a lot of the natural gas in the United States is uh, now being extracted with fracking and also mm -hmm. extracting a lot of uh, oil that way mm -hmm. as well. Um, so obviously, you've got the, the environmental challenges around that mm -hmm. uh, and we, we have to make sure that the rules and regulations for fracking are in place and as importantly if not more so the enforcement of those rules with very serious uh, repercussions if you violate those rules are in place because um, the, the, the chance of, of, of some of the chemicals they use in fracking getting to aquifers is virtually non-existent because of the way it's actually constructed. Uh, the aquifers are typically only 400 to 1,000 feet down, and they're going down 8,000 feet. So there's a huge physical distance between the two, and that first 1,000 or whatever feet is, has very tight containment around it. Uh, I'm not an expert in fracking. I've just done some reading myself here. Sure. But again, it's done right. It's a very economical way to produce gas, and frankly, it's, 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 it's allowed us to be a a net exporter of natural gas and oil again for the first time in decades mm -hmm. here in the United States. And what do we see every day when we go to the gas station? Two dollar and ten cent gas, gasoline for example. Mm -hmm. And for heating our homes and for, for power prices generally, it's been very, very attractive. The prices have come down dramatically. Um, so, but everything's got pros and cons to it. And, and you know, you, you can't sacrifice the environment for cheap fuel. And that's the key behind the strict regulations and uh, as importantly, the, the strict enforcement around those yeah, regulations. Because when, when we take our natural gas, primarily that's coming, what, from Maine and Canada? Is that correct? Our it comes from a number of different sources. It comes from Canada, anyway. comes through. Uh, some of it comes from, uh, uh, you know, from New York State in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the talk about the new pipelines is going to actually increase the capacity uh, in those directions. We also, when we need it, we can bring in liquefied natural gas into a terminal up in Mystic, um, okay, up near yeah. Mystic Power Plant. In, in Everett, and that can provide a gas source to the, to the to the New England market as well. Yeah. 
Is, is that not done as much now, bringing in the liquid gas? I mean, that used to be a big thing. The tanks are always, you know, they, they kind of go up and down. I remember that when they were filled and when they were empty. Um, we again, still? not a real expert on the gas side. I'm more yeah. on, on the electric, on the electric? side from, okay. uh, from my years at the company. But, uh, you know, as I understand it, uh, you know, as we got more availability and less expensive gas from the shale, we took more of it. So there's less need for the LNG to come in. Okay. So let, let's take, well, we have somebody from, the, from National Grid here. One of the big questions I have, and it's, it, it's a question that I actually found myself asking about my bill. The electric bill is relatively simple, but yet people constantly trip over it. You know? And I think, and we started talking about this before the show, is it's broken down what, into distribution, usage, which is how much we use, whether we, uh, we spend a lot of uh, energy or we, we can reduce some, and then supply. Yeah, you've got, the bill comes in two pages. The first page is typically all the delivery charges. And the first page is also where they tell you what the meter reading, what the meter reading on your electric meter was when they last read it, which typically was two or three or four days before you get the bill. And they also show you the meter reading the last time we read it. You subtract the two and that's your monthly usage. Okay. For a lot of customers, it's in the 700 to 1500 kilowatt hours a month. Um, so now you know how many kilowatt hours you'll be billed for, for delivering it to your house or business and uh, for also the supply piece of the bill. The first lines are the distribution components, which is broken into two components actually now. And it's, it's a, what they call a block rate for distribution. And distribution is what actually pays for the poles and wires out in front of your house. Okay. That's the only part that's paying for that. Um, and the block rates are designed really to incent people to use less because the first 600 kilowatt hours a month on the residential bill are priced at oh four and a half cents or so. If you use more than 600 kilowatt hours, you're paying five and a half or six cents because you're using more. Okay. Um, so that's broken into two and also for small commercial customers, a similar block pricing. And again, is part of regulatory policy that the state wanted to uh, get people to save energy. Uh, so that's the first line or couple of lines. And then you've got the transmission line. That's the big towers you see going all over the, the state that connect those big substations, mm -hmm. the big gray uh, boxes that are in fenced in areas. Um, very, very, I mean, they're all signed with uh, danger keep out because it is a very dangerous situation mm -hmm. inside those fences. You never want to be inside there. Um, but so then you have a transmission component. Uh, that's the second piece of the bill. There's other parts of the bill that talk about the energy efficiency surcharges, you know, the, all the programs we have for paying rebates for more efficient appliances, for putting in uh, low temperature, high efficiency heat pump systems and that sort of thing. That's an energy efficiency surcharge. That's a pays for those programs. And then you've got a, uh, a line called transition, uh, f um, which actually is what was left over when we divested ourselves of the power plants um, some of the uh, money that was left in the books, plus some of the nuclear decommissioning costs that are still out there. It's currently negative because there, there's been some over collections in the past, but it's a very, very small number. Even when it was positive, it's very small, like half a cent or a, a, a quarter okay. of a cent, very small. Um, and again, there's lots of lines, okay, but as part of the restructuring law in 97, we were required to break the bill into all its components. Uh, so it was, uh, it was uh, so people knew what pieces were, were there. And then there's a renewable charge, which actually funds the Mass Clean Energy Center uh, as part of uh, the Mass Division of Energy Resources. And that's where um, different types of clean energy programs are funded out of that monies. And that's page one, that's your delivery costs. Mm -hmm. um, page two is the supply costs. If you're buying the default service from us, because you haven't gone out and looked for a third party energy supplier, you'll get charged, I think it's about eight and a half cents nowadays. This is uh, um, late September, 2016. So, so that's the second page. And each one of these components, like I said, the four cent distribution delivery or the eight cent supply charge is a per kilowatt hour charge. Okay. So if you use a thousand kilowatt hours and, you, and you've got a uh, um, supply cost of eight and a half cents, well, that's $85 you're going to, as your supply charges on that 1,000 kilowatt hour bill. So then you're going to add the supply piece on page two to the delivery piece on page one. That's your total bill. And we really appreciate people paying those bills on time. 
<laughs> need the money, right? <laughs> well, it's a need <laughs> Big money. organization. It's, yeah. it's a cash flow issue, right? Sure. It's just cash yeah. flow, right? We need you to keep continually going. fund the system. And, uh, and again, it's just, uh, and uh, it's great because, you know, the vast majority of people are very, very good about paying the bills. So I think with the new regulation, and this is something that I, I find uh, many people I talk to do get confused about, um, and I, I've talked to a number of people, so it's not just one or two people. They have a sense that, and, and there is kind of a loyalty to National Grid. I mean, because you do control a lot. Like, as long as you take care of everything, they never see you or think about you. Uh, they like to row. Yeah, they have this, loyal, <laughs> this loyalty type of thing. Right? <laughs> we talk about switching to a renewable or a green energy, or even some companies are selling fossil fuel energy, you know, as a, uh, part of the dereg deregulation yeah. plan. But I, I, I was told by some people, you're fine with people getting green energy, renewable energy, because you can't make money on that well, anyhow. The, the, the Restructuring Act of 1997 mm -hmm. got us out of the power generation business. Right. And since then, we've been telling people, you don't have to buy your supply from us. You have to buy delivery because there's only one pole line going down the street. It'd be really bad if you had right. five or six different pole lines for five or six companies on the same road, and you could pick one or the other. It's kind of, you know, people... I mean, I love how pole lines look, but I know some people aren't as uh, aren't, mm. don't don't have my taste for that. But ultimately, um, so the supply piece is wide open for any number of suppliers. You can go on the Mass Department of Public Utility website. You can go on the Mass DOER website and you get a list of suppliers. You can pick and choose which ones you want to to, to select. Uh, the the regulator has actually the DPU has actually had a proceeding going on for for a little while here to make sure the suppliers are being as um, as uh, straight with how they're selling the product right. as they could be, right? There was, some people got caught up um, where there were automatic renewables in contracts and there were automatic price increases in contracts and they may or may not have read the fine print properly mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they found themselves paying a lot more than they thought they'd signed up for, but sure. the contract said, oh, nope, sorry, you did sign this. It was a forefront there, but you know, when you didn't have your glasses, you signed it and uh oh, you got stuck with it. So the whole disclosure around supplier uh, arrangements and payments is all something very going on as we speak. It's going on around the, the, uh, the Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York. Sure. A lot of states are making sure that because it was kind of a buyer beware thing out there, but the states are really cracking down and make sure the suppliers are being straight with their offers. And so you can actually compare apples to apples. Sure. And then you can go ahead and select whoever you like. Um, and we'll... we'll um, We'll, and we'll bill for that supplier on their behalf. That'll be on that supply. Right, and you, page. like some states don't do that. But <laughs> in Mass, we're lucky because we can have the one bill instead of you having can. two bills coming now, in. Now, the larger customers, a lot of them like to have a separate bill. You know, so they okay. got the supplier bill separately from the, the delivery like bill. Like a commercial type of bill. Uh, yeah, yeah, commercial uh, accounts. Okay. But virtually every, when you ha in the residential market, uh, very few suppliers actually want to spend the money to send a separate bill. And they can just tell us. Um, through a monthly um, electronic transfer uh, uh, system, um, what the price that month is for that one customer. So when we read the meter, we'll just apply that price to those kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. We'll collect the money and then we'll send it off to the supplier. Which, when I, I mean, that business model is great. And there are some great companies right now. Oh, sure. What we do, I have Go Green Consortium, and we actually vet a lot of those companies for people. Oh, good. And yeah. then we go out and do educational programs in the community and say, you know, this is a company I think that you you should look into and, and read this portion of the contract because you it, it can change what you think you have. Sure. And uh, so it's been pretty good. That was always the question to say, well, I, I don't want National Grid mad at me if I go to green energy. But don't, don't you have a mandate to be at 30 uh, percent of green energy by sometime in the future, by 2030? Is that a, a yeah, fact? Yeah, underneath the in the way they the state, a lot of states do this isn't just Massachusetts they put in statute a renewable portfolio standard. And mm -hmm. what that essentially requires, any entity that sells electricity in the state of Massachusetts, and because we still have a default, I mean, we have a default service. It's called that because we're the default service if you don't want a supplier or you, or, or you haven't picked one yet. Right. And that's why we have it. So whatever our, our total default sales are a year, and for you know these other energy suppliers, however, however many, whatever their sales are a year, there's a percentage of that, you have to buy in the form of renewable energy, energy certificates, RECs. Okay. Um, um, they're now things called solar RECs, S RECs. S -RECs yeah. And there's a percentage you have to buy, and it typically increases year on year so that you get a higher and higher uh, penetration of solar. 
Uh, I don't think Mass has gotten to 30 percent. I know Rhode Island recently passed legislation where they're trying to get to 30 percent by 2025 or something uh -huh. like that. But it is going to be, I think it's in the low 20s uh, through 2020. So you think they'll move you up as? Yeah, they'll slowly but surely. Plus, if everybody wanted green energy, it's not available anyhow. There's not enough to treat, you know, to supply. Today, there's n simply right. not enough. Yeah. Um, again, I talked about that nighttime need for energy that you can't get from a solar project, for example. And even if you had energy storage to store some of it, well, you'd have to make your solar project a lot bigger to generate enough during the day to have enough for overnight. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some... Yeah, it, it won't balance out for a while, I think. The well, te technology then, will catch up. And just with solar just has physical limitations. You can only fit so many of those panels on a roof or in your backyard. Right. So you can't, you know, you can't, it's hard to, you know, put enough in, unless you got a big piece of property or a big huge barn roof, uh, to actually meet what your needs are. Uh, on and and I see again, I mean, I, I think when people talk solar, I, they, they always have this idea that at some point they'll be able to go off grid and uh, totally be served by solar. I don't see that coming for 25 years, well, if it some, ever comes. Well, there's a physics problem. Right. Okay. Solar produces good uh, green energy, but um, how do I explain this? There's not a lot of uh, oomph behind it. And what I mean is that in your house, you've got, you know, typically, you know, maybe a water pump. If you've got a well, you've got an electric dryer sometimes. You've got an electric water heater. You've got a stove or a range. You've got your refrigerator freezers. They all, they all, they all have, especially the refrigerators and freezers, have compressors in them that when they start, it's a little motor and it takes a lot of power to get it turning. Mm -hmm. Once it's turned, it's fine, but that first half a second needs a lot of power. Well, solar can't produce enough power that quickly to provide what they call inrush power or inrush current for those mm -hmm. motors. So in order to start those motors, like your air conditioner or whatnot, if you just had solar, you would probably, as it's tried to pull power from the solar, the solar array couldn't generate enough and you would collapse the voltage and the system would trip offline. Okay. So what you need is you need a source that is firm enough mm -hmm. that, can, that can provide that inrush power and let the solar kind of sit in the background. And that's why people really have to stay connected to the electric distribution system so they can run their systems properly in their homes. Right. People don't understand that only because it's kind of getting in the weeds about electrical stuff and yeah, it, it, I mean that's where it, I live, right? Right. Yeah. So, so I understand it. I help people understand it, but it's something that people go, ah, that's not true. Well, yeah, we'll try it someday. You yeah. know, um, the other challenge you have with 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 uh, solar is that it does need um, a voltage source to actually operate. Mm -hmm. So it can't run independently unless it's specifically designed to be run in an off-grid mode. Um, and if it is designed for that, it's got a, a supplemental battery or even a small generator that provides a voltage source so the solar mm -hmm. can, can work. Otherwise, you do need to be connected, what we call in parallel with the electric distribution system, for the solar to work properly. I mean, that's what I tell people, and I'm, I'm certainly not an electrician, but I say that, you know, the, it only makes sense to have National Grid as a partner. And if you can afford to put a solar system up and you put one on and you, you're taking a percentage of your electricity, you know, it, it's good. It, it probably won't cost out for 10 or 15 years. So that well, you're with, the, with, with, with the past subsidy programs, and they're all changing, actually mm -hmm. the state is announcing a new program Friday, as far as I know, um, the paybacks actually had gotten down to four or five or six years. It, it come down dramatically. Um, and I think they're going to stay at that level. And is that with something you mentioned earlier, the, and, mm -hmm. and that, that's a whole show, SREX. Yeah, SREX <laughs> and net meter and credits, yeah. Boom. So, yeah, with those two programs, e it was easier four or five year payback for solar. The new programs um, should maintain that because the beauty of what's happening is the price of solar has gone from you know a, this level to this level in, uh -huh. in the last five years. I mean, it's drop, dropped dramatically. Um, so that even though the, 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 the programs will pay less when you put in solar, your underlying costs will be a lot less. So you still, five-year payback shouldn't be too hard to get to. Well, that's not bad. I mean, no. so you could own it. I mean, for those people who, go, who can afford to buy it, if they buy a system, so they own it in five years, and it, some people say they can guarantee them 85% of their electric. Uh, I can't see that myself, but you're an, you, if you're If they have field. a big enough, if they have a big enough roof, yeah. you can easily do that. Uh -huh. It's just, again, the, the size of the roof. Physical the size comes into play. Sure. And, you know, 
most homes built up until just recently weren't designed around you know maximum solar exposure you know I just built a big new garage on my on my house and I did design it for solar exposure because someday when I get enough money I'm gonna probably put solar on that roof uh, or be ready for it or for someone to be ready for it so um, it's oriented in the right direction and it's gonna work perfectly when when and if I, I, I get to that point um, so most roofs have too many protrusions and this thing sticking sure. out of it here and there. So it's hard to put enough panels on a roof uh, to generate enough power. But some of the larger homes, and as you know, there's plenty of larger homes up, up this way, where they got big garage roofs or barns or whatnot, or even you see people put, a, put them in the back, back 40 of their sure. house. house yeah. lot, uh, put a ground mount, ground mount yeah. You know? And, uh, now here's a, I guess the question, the, the ground mounts are, are good, and not all companies do that, but... Uh, you, do you see, a, and have you heard probably maybe being in touch with this, I guess everybody says everything will change when there's an adequate battery that could be fit in a house that could actually contain solar or actually just store electricity, and it doesn't exist right now, according to everybody. Well, they're selling those Tesla power walls that are like seven kilowatt hour batteries. Mm -hmm. And to put that in perspective, you know, I talked to everybody about a customer who used 1,000 kilowatt hours a month, right? Well, you got 30 days to the month, so that's what, 30 to 35 kilowatt hours a day you're using. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a 7 kilowatt hour battery, you're only going to be able to uh, hand, you know, uh, run your house normally for about 20% of, of that day. So you're only going to get three or four hours out of it anyway. Um, the good news is that most power outages by far are less than five or six or seven hours. They're really not that long. They, very inconvenient. I'm mm -hmm. not going to suggest they're not, and I'm not happy when it happens at my house either. Um, but the problem with, with a 7 kilowatt hour battery, it's not going to help you if we, when, not if, but when the next big blizzard hits sure. and you're out of power for two or three days. All right, so here's, here's one of the things I want you to get our audience. What does it look like, uh, you know, I think two winters ago we got hit pretty good with uh, the cost of uh, electric generation and uh, What's it look like this winter? Any uh, well, thoughts? Well, the, the, yep, the uh, system operator, the ISO New England, independent system operator in New England, has a program where they, where they incent big power generators have dual fuel capabilities. So even though they're fired with natural gas, uh, many of the plants in, uh, either have or have retrofit to be allowed to, that they can burn diesel instead. Because in a real cold snap, the home heating is priority number one. They right. get the gas and the power plants don't. Um, so ultimately those in those past winters there simply wasn't enough gas and there wasn't a dual fuel capability for these big power plants um, that they could run if they didn't have oil. So it got into a fairly serious condition where we even had almost uh, rolling power outages because there wasn't enough gas. Luckily it didn't happen because of lots of different things that are in place there but because the oil was so much more expensive then uh, the price of power, the, that supply piece I talked about, for example, I mm -hmm. said our defaults are on eight cents. Well, it shot to 16 cents a kilowatt hour for the months of January, February, March, or, or, or through the winter of 2013 and 14. 16 cents mm -hmm. on top of your eight cent delivery, 20, a quarter yeah. a kilowatt hour, which is unheard of in my, my 30 years at the company. Um, so it woke up a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but luckily, the, like I said, the ISO has been doing lots of work around balancing things, uh, getting the dual fuel capability. And we saw the evidence this past winter where we didn't see anywhere close to those type of prices right, yeah. at all. And we, we had, fortunately had a mild winter. Yeah, but, a mild winter didn't, uh, that and, helped uh, as well. But I mean, it, it's interesting how, how that will happen. So, so we can expect the unexpected, I guess. Always planned yeah, with electricity yeah. in the winter. Expect I mean, the, the challenge we have now, now that the uh, pipeline uh, issue is somewhat moot at this point, you know, expansion mm -hmm. of the gas, natural gas pipeline is, is at least on temporary hold. At some point, we'll have to invest in more of that infrastructure. It's just somewhere, yeah. somehow, we'll have to do things. Um, you know, people will, will, will get more creative now, potentially, versus just maybe just building a bigger pipeline. There's a lot of other things you can do from the engineering side to get more capacity out of existing facilities. So I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things going on now. But, you know, our natural gas customers in this area, naturally, we're obligated to make sure we procure enough natural gas for them so they stay nice and warm during the winter months. And that's our key, okay. key factor there. So um, we're committed to making sure that no one gets cold this month. If, if, if they want to pay the price, they can, they can be as uh, warm as it's they like. There. Great. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we could go on for another half hour with you, but um, 
we're, we're coming to a close. I, I just got a minute. I, I was going to offer some people, uh, anybody who would like to contact the station, we, we did pick up some from people like Mass Save and people like that. They have this, uh, these are special light bulbs and they're LED light bulbs. Anybody would like to, they can uh, email gogreenconsortium at gmail.com and I think they can put that up on the screen for you. And the first 12 people call, I'll give them a free light bulb. How's that? Just call, you, you're going to have to call by Gmail, though. Just contact me by Gmail, and we'll get you a free light bulb. I'll, I'll deliver it. How's that? Okay. Anyhow, thanks for coming, and uh, I appreciate your time, and I hope we educated some people out Great. there. At least Just start don't, don't forget to get, get your Mass Save Energy Audit, because they'll come out okay. and give you the light bulbs and do a lot of great work for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much.